Good evening. As I was going around talking to everyone this morning, I did it. This evening, I kept saying to everybody, good morning. It's not morning, is it? It's good evening. I want to welcome you to our Good Friday service at West, West, uh, West David Baptist Church. It's going to be a little bit different service tonight, so just kind of follow the cues. There's going to be lots of moving parts, a lot of different people involved in the service. So just follow along as we go, and let's open with prayer, and then we'll start. Father, I thank you that you have brought us together to celebrate one of the most infamous times in the history of the world, with that your death on the cross. And I pray, Lord, that we will always remember what you did, what you sacrificed for us. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
We're going to do an alternate reading, and this is taken from Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 3. So you can either look up on the screen or on the um, sheet that you got when you came in. I'll do the first part, and then you follow. The Lord be with you. We gather here to worship God. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Thank you. Lord Jesus, I thank you again that we have a chance to worship together, to remember, to look back on, to think about the things that you did, the sacrifices you made, so that we could have eternal life. Tonight, we're going to do the seven last words, actually the seven last phrases of Jesus when he was on the cross. So we'll start with the first one. When they came to the place called Skull, they nailed Jesus to the cross there and two criminals, one on the right and one on his left. Jesus said, forgive them, Father, they do not know what they are doing. For those of us who are familiar with Jesus' life, this quote from Jesus is nothing unusual. Jesus was always ready and willing to forgive people. In fact, that's one of the main reasons he came to earth. He was about to die so that our sin could be forgiven. But what makes this scene different is that Jesus had just been nailed to a cross. The lack of sleep, the beatings, the scourging, then the crown of thorns, and then the walk to the place of the skull with the cross on his back, and finally the driving of the nails through his hands and feet would have put him in the most excruciating pain imaginable. From his head to his feet, every part of his body was in pain. That pain would force Jesus to focus on it and try somehow to get some relief. Of course, with this type of torture, there was no way to get any relief. And so it would only be natural for Jesus only to think of his own suffering and his own pain. And how would he feel emotionally as he hung there on that evil tree. He was innocent. Every charge against him was false. The people he loved had left him. He was being mocked, made fun of, jeered at, spit on. No one was coming to his aid, nor could they. He was alone. Even if he wasn't in severe physical pain, which he was, he was also in severe emotional and mental pain. And it was the people he was looking at were the ones who caused this pain. The people he was looking at stared back at him in hatred and disgust and cruelty. And in spite of all this, in spite of all the pain in both body and mind, Jesus ignores all that physical and emotional pain and says the most amazing statement, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. can wash away my sin what can make me whole again please join our voices as we sing together the wonderful cross in your hymnal it's hymn number 239 
Now we'll have the second word. One of the criminals hanging here threw insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other one, however, rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God? Here we are, all under the same sentence, ours. However, is only right, for we are getting what we deserve for what we did. But he has done nothing wrong. And he has said to Jesus, Remember Jesus. me when you come as king. Jesus said to him, I tell you this, today you will be in paradise with me. In the first statement Jesus made, we see the incredible love Jesus expresses in spite of all the pain that he was going through. Well, the pain continues in the second phrase as one of the criminals yells at him in anger. But then the criminal on the other side of Jesus says something else. This criminal, who's done something so terrible that he's being crucified, is the first one since Jesus was arrested to show any sympathy to Jesus, other than the ladies along the way as Jesus was carrying his cross. But this criminal, he's the first one, other than the mourners on the way, to care about Jesus. And then he pleads with Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This criminal, who knows he's a criminal, may be the first person to actually understand what the cross meant. Even the disciples wouldn't understand what the cross meant until after Jesus rose from the dead. But this criminal realizes that Jesus is the Messiah. He realizes that Jesus can forgive him for all his sins and his misdeeds. And he realizes that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. For the first time in this entire ordeal, Jesus has something to smile about. Through all the blood and all the anguish, Jesus smiles. Now, it may not have been a real smile because of the beatings and the pain, but it was a smile at least in his heart. And he says to the criminal, Today, you will be with me in paradise. as we sing hymn number 170, Oh, How He Loves You and Me. third word.
standing close to Jesus' cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there. So he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time, the disciple took her to live in his home. Again, we see the incredible supernatural love of Jesus. Why would he, in all his pain, think about the future of his mother? Well, sure, a son loves his mother, but here is Jesus, the one who should be getting the sympathy and the empathy. He was the one hanging by nails on a cross, and yet it is he who gives comfort. John, take care of my mom. But there's something else here. God designed family, and his plan is for a man and a woman to marry and raise a family. That's called a nuclear family. And it's part of a larger extended family, grandparents, aunts and uncles, nieces, nephews, grandchildren. Sometimes the extended family goes beyond the family of origin. Close friends may become part of a family, nuclear or extended. There's a connection that happens within the family that should result in each member being taken care of. Family needs to take care of family. Jesus makes this clear here. In spite of how terrible he's feeling, he still thinks of his mom and her immediate and future needs. Mother, behold your son. John, behold your mother. seated and join your voices in hymn number 228, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed. fourth word. From Mark, the 15th chapter, verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Throughout Christian history, this statement by Jesus has been used to explain that God forsook or disowned Jesus. He disowned him not because he didn't love him, but because Jesus had been made sin for us 
And there could be no sin within the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in reality, God never forsook Jesus. He was there all the time. Just like Jesus is with us all the time, even when we find ourselves in sin. But something happened to their relationship when Jesus went to the cross. We can try to explain it, but just like trying to explain how Jesus could be God and man at the same time, or how the Holy Spirit can be inside each one of us all at the same time, well, our brains just can't seem to handle it. In any case, Jesus was expressing deep, deep suffering and feelings of abandonment. But I believe there's something else in this verse, equally important, in Jesus' choice of words. When Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually quoting one of David's psalms, Psalm 22. And the psalm begins with those words. But what's most interesting about that psalm is that later on in the psalm, David describes a crucifixion. He even describes the soldiers gambling for Jesus' clothing. Crucifixion had not been invented until 400 years after David lived. How did he know that there was such a thing? The Holy Spirit inspired him to write those words. And I believe Jesus was using those words to give the Jews one last chance for redemption. He was giving them that one last chance to look at that psalm and see who Jesus really was. Again, Jesus, in all this pain, thinks of how he might help people, and in this case, the people who are responsible for all his pain, so that they too could find salvation. Please remain seated as we sing our next hymn, Amazing Love, hymn number 168.
the fifth word. Jesus was human. As I already said, we can't fully explain how that could be, but in any case, these words certainly make that clear. He has had tremendous blood loss, not so much from the nails as from the flogging he took before he was crucified. His body was screaming for water because of how much fluid had already been taken from his body. He was thirsty. Along with that thirst, he felt every possible kind of pain a person could feel. He felt the torn flesh. He felt the cramped muscles. He felt the dislocated joints. He felt the heavy nails piercing his body. He felt it all so that we could have an eternal life where there would be no more pain and no more sorrow and no more tears. One moment, please. I don't have any. We don't have our music.
The sixth word. John 19, 29 through 30. The bowl was there full of cheap wine mixed with vinegar. So a sponge was soaked in it, put it on a stalk of hyssop, and lifted up to his lips. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. It is finished. What was finished? His crucifixion? His ministry? His life? Actually, this verse has a little bit different meaning. The Greek word used here is tetelestai, which is translated, it is finished. But it has a much broader meaning than that. It means completed, discharged, ended, paid, performed. The word was also used to mean paid in full. It would be stamped or written on a receipt when it was paid in full. Because of our sin, we owed a debt to God. We could not pay it. It was too expensive for us to pay because the payment meant we would die. Not just physical death, but also spiritual death. The payment was eternal separation from God. So instead, Jesus took the debt with him to the cross and paid it in full with his life. When Jesus died on the cross, not only was his ministry over, his crucifixion over, his life over, but our debt to God was over. To Telestai, it is finished. It was paid in full.
the Lord's Supper together in remembrance of him. And you remember, um, we see it right here, this do in remembrance of me. And that's what the Lord's Supper is all about. It's not about enjoying a meal together. It's about remembering Jesus. And not just remembering Jesus as the person who loved and served people, but the Jesus who died for us. It was the night before he died that he instituted the Lord's Supper. And obviously there's not a lot of things we do in the church here that we have to do. But this is one of them. Do this in remembrance of me. So that night, the night before he was betrayed, he took bread. They were having their Seder together. And that night he took bread and he broke it, which is part of the Seder meal. And when he broke it, he said, this is my body that is, shed, that is given for you. And if we think back to that, not only do we remember his body and what he did, but remember today. What are we doing today? And then he said, someday we're going to take this with him together in heaven. So during communion, we get to look back at the past, what's happening today, and then what's going to happen in the future. That night, Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body that is given for you. Let's eat together.
then at the end of the meal, he took the cup. And I think they used one cup and everybody took sips out of it. We're not going to do that tonight. But he took the cup and he said, this is my blood that is shed for you. And as we've talked tonight and with the music and the songs and the, and the teaching, everything points at what Jesus did for us. His sacrifice, his blood that was literally shed for us. And Jesus said, drink all of it. This is my blood that is shed for you. The seventh word. Jesus was obedient to God always. In the garden, the night before he was nailed to that cross, he prayed to his father and he asked if somehow he wouldn't have to go through the incredible pain and suffering of the cross. But then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. From the time he was a child, he had a deep, pure trust in God, his Father. He had always put himself in God's hands. Now, we often hear songs or sermons from the, uh, about how even if he wanted to come down from the cross, he would not do it. His love would keep him from coming down. But in reality, Jesus didn't say, if possible, let this cup pass from me, but I love these people so much, I'll die for them anyway. That's not what he said. What he said was, if possible, let this cup pass from me, but, Father, I will do whatever you want me to do. Jesus had this incredible trust in his Father. That was the reason he was able to obey him 
no matter what the cost, even if the cost was his life. And now, at the end of his life, in spite of all the things God has asked him to do, all the suffering God has told him to go through, all the pain of becoming a man and dying a most horrific death, he still puts himself in his father's hands. It was a pure, undefiled, perfect trust in God that kept him on the cross. And he ends with, into your hands I commit my spirit. He was just doing what he always did, giving himself to God and letting God have his way with him. The question I want us to wrestle with tonight when we go home, do we trust God with our lives the way Jesus trusted God with his? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you. Thank you, such a a weak word to express how we feel about what you did for us. How can we thank you? How can we say thanks for what you went through? the pain you suffered, not just physical pain, emotional pain, the pain of watching your friends leave you, the pain of the nails, the pain of the whip, the pain of all that stuff, and then taking all our sins on your body on that tree. I thank you, Lord. As weak as those words are, I thank you. I praise you. We adore you because of what you've done for us. And I pray, Lord, as we go home tonight, that we will remember. But I also pray, Lord, that we won't just remember your death. We won't just remember the pain you suffered. We'll also look forward to Sunday. Because Sunday's coming, and Sunday's the day that you rose from the dead. You resurrected from the dead. And because you did that, we know that we too, one day, will rise from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, and praise you. And all God's people said...